Can you tell us about your experience in the industry and your role at AGC? Uh, so I've been in the industry around 35 years. So I uh, started off as a, an engineer in the, in the Navy, as a weapons engineer. Uh, and that's really when I get introduced <coughs> to PCBs because part of my job uh, maintaining missile systems was actually repairing printed circuit boards. And then when I left the Navy, I, <laughs> I started a part-time job as a process engineer, helping my brother in a company that then became uh, Via Systems uh, Europe. Okay. Uh, and then I became, uh, uh, then we were developing some of the new processes, like that was the first time lasers come out. And we were developing a lot of new um, blind processing and even back in those days, we were building 32 layer, three mil line of space. So very high end mm -hmm. product for companies uh, like Sun Microsystems, uh, like the Sun Serengeti type series product. Uh, since then, I've worked for uh, Via Systems, Cortec, FTG, DDI, and, and most of them roles were uh, senior roles as um, process engineering, field application engineering and quality. Um, and then recently, about two years or 18 months ago, I, I joined AGC uh, and really my role is fairly similar. I'm still field application engineers and I also do technical sales. Uh, we specialize okay. in really uh, exotic high frequency type materials. So most of the product that we manufacture for North America is getting into military and aerospace type applications. Uh, we are developing some new products, which we'll be actually introducing at Apex next week. Okay, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Uh, so how did you become an aerospace PCB expert? Um, <laughs> not really through choice. It was, um, uh, it probably started back 15, 18 years ago when I was at Cortec um, and I got involved uh, between field application engineering and quality um, because a lot of our aerospace customers would come in for source inspection. Uh, so I typically get involved when the source inspectors were actually on site from the aerospace companies. Um, and that's really how I got started and understood aerospace requirements and at the time we were developing satellite customers. So the, over the past 15 years, I've dealt a lot with aerospace and satellite type um, customers. Um, and, and I also teach, um, and I'm also a co-chair of the 9121 committee, which is PCB defects. Uh, so really we get involved um, heavily in the military and aerospace because they do a lot more analysis when they see failures and obviously the quality needs to be at a much higher level. So they tend to want to understand your capabilities. So that's again, on the process engineering side, I get involved in uh, aerospace customers doing audits on site. So we understood exactly what the requirements were. Okay, that's great. So uh, what are the most common design challenges for aerospace boards? Wow, that's a good question. So yeah. aerospace tries to be conservative. Uh, the reason they try to be conservative is, is for reliability. So they will not <clears throat> they will not try and design with leading or bleeding edge type technologies because um, th there's not enough knowledge or data to back that up to prove that it's reliable. So um, they tend to you know, use larger vias, they tend to prefer to use um, uh, higher temperature type materials, like for, for instance, with satellite, they would tend to migrate towards polyamides. Um, so they try and use design practices that are proven and as, as reliable as possible. So they're going to use, especially in board shops, they're going to select board shops that they know 
do a lot of class three type product. They're not going to select a board shop that does class two and a little bit of class three. They prefer board shops that are doing uh, primarily class three type product day in and day out. So design wise is basically being conservative. You know. Okay. Can you quickly explain how vibrations impact boards and what can be done to avoid damage? Um, so again, this is, we, we could get really into this in a lot of detail. So this would be, um, this is down to reliability. So um, if you look at the, the process itself, so they're, they're going to want to select materials that can withstand high impact or uh, high amounts of vibration. Uh, if you can imagine boards that go into aircraft or satellites see massive amount of vibration on a daily basis. Um, yeah. So that they're going to select materials that are um, uh, more reliable. Um, they're going to basically look at uh, additional plating. Uh, if you're a board shop, you'd have to prove or you should be proven on a, on a monthly basis that your tensile and elongation uh, meet the minimum requirements for um, 21 or uh, uh, the T and E's actually meet the, the minimum requirements for them customers. So uh, normally what you have to do is make submissions every month to prove um, the reliability of your copper, you know, that it's uh, elasticity and it's not brittle. So um, so basically, I would say plating's a big uh, requirement, and the material itself. Typically, a lot of these products, when they're uh, mounted in uh, high vibration type environments, there's usually some damper system as well. But the boards will see uh, some excessive type of vibration. So, um, so typically, that's part of the aerospace design or the satellite design to try and minimize the amount of vibration because if you imagine it, it's also down to uh, the solder joints, the components. And so again, you wanna make sure <clears throat> during the assembly process that the joints are not brittle. So again, they're selecting uh, types of solder that are designed for this type of environment that these type of boards go into. And that's all down even to the, the type of component. So you wanna make sure you're um, selecting components that can withstand high amounts of vibration without cracking. So, you know, things like ceramic components can be more prone to vibration cracking. Right, okay. So according to you, which is the ideal PCB material for space applications? <laughs> Um, that's changing. Um, uh, many moons ago, everything was polyamide. Uh, it still is a lot. Okay. Um, the problem of polyamide, I just, <laughs> the previous question was a good one. Uh, the, the problem with polyamide, because it's such a, uh, it's, it's a very brittle material. Uh, so it can be very prone during, especially if you're building like planar magnetic type boards with a lot of heavy copper. Uh, it can be very prone to micro cracking um, and the aerospace guys hit that, but it's, a, it, it sort of goes hand in hand. You can't use a brittle material and prevent micro cracks. Um, so actually we're working on a new material, which we've been testing. Uh, the testing hopefully will be complete by next week that basically eliminates that micro cracking uh, uh, issue. Uh, the other thing okay. with that material is it's got a very low CTE. Um, so it's, it's less prone to expansion and contraction and, and cracking in some of these environments. Now, uh, some of the other materials used in space are for high speed, like antennas, et cetera, as well. So they're using a very low loss, high speed uh, PTFE type uh, products. Um, right. So yeah, there's, there's new materials being developed. We've been working on one for 18 months and uh, we've released the first higher DK version about six months ago. And now we're about to release a low DK version. Um, and the advantage to a PCB shop is this is a pure resin system. So you can use it for okay. infill, you can use it for whole fill. 
and we've been getting very, very good results for high reliability stack micrograph. So when you're using heavy copper, um, because we use a print and etch process, uh, which is changing because we're, we're, we're all starting to move to MSAP and ASAP type processing and build up, but 90% of what we do or 95% of what we do is, is still print and etch. So the problem is when you do print and etch with heavy copper, your, the edges of your traces or copper features tend to taper down. So these, these little tapers or points at the bottom of the traces, um, they act like a, a high stress point. So when you use uh, a resin system like polyamide, which is a very brittle resin system, because of the amount of infill to fill all the heavy copper, these little areas at the bottom with the heating and contracting become stress points and they cause these little, uh, in the industry we call them tail cracks, but they're basically little micro cracks at the edges or the, the, the pointy bits of the, the copper traces. So there's, uh, I've, I've tried <laughs> numerous times over the years to try and eliminate them uh, and I haven't been able to, but uh, with this new resin system we're developing we haven't seen any micro cracks yet and we're on our fourth test. So, and that's uh, the test field that we're using is a 20 layer four inch copper planar magnetic design. So it's, uh, so it's better match. So uh, some newer materials are basically going to help eliminate some of these issues that we see. Uh, and then I know of you guys are building heavy copper polyamide. You're probably seeing the same issue as well. These little micro cracks. Okay, thank you. So which substrate material would you recommend to dissipate heat? <laughs> so the material we developed was actually developed to be thermally conductive. So, uh, but what you have to understand is if you're building PCB materials, um, uh, there, there's still gonna be some sort of resin system. And the resin system itself is a thermal barrier. So. So even the best materials like um, as Malabar, uh, you're still only gonna be able to get um, two to three watts per meter K of thermal conductivity, which isn't a lot, but it's much better than a standard FR4, which is only 0.3 watts per meter K. The other challenge with these materials as I find that was building some product for aerospace is they're very heavily loaded. So they've got very little resin system and the design I was trying to build with two inch copper, I was getting delamination and uh, void issues. And eventually when I looked at it, uh, the supplier then told me that it was, it only had 15% resin. So basically there was just yeah. no resin in that material uh, to infill any type of heavy copper. So we had to go back to a lower DK version with the high resin system um, so it sort of defeated the point of the object. So, um, so there is materials out there. You're probably not going to get anything better than, I'd say, manufacturably two watts per meter K. Um, our material, our, our thermally conductive one that I was just explaining, is, is around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 watts per meter K. But the advantage of that is it, it can be supplied in a one mil film. So the end of a very thin thermal barrier you need to do to dissipate heat. So I teach designers um, different ways to dissipate heat using thermal vias, um, stitching down into um, the heat sink. Um, or the other way is that we used to do was we design it where the, we would mill the edges of the board down to a ground plane. And then as a board slotted into the chassis um, the heat would dissipate down through the ground planes and then the chassis became part of the thermal management system. So there, there is other ways to do it. But yeah, materials, unfortunately, are not the best at dissipating heat. Yeah, right. So like my next question is about that only. Often designers use heavy copper heat sink and fans for heat dissipation. Do you have any other advanced cooling methods? Um, uh, we have built product in the past using heat pipes. 
Um, so the heat pipes were actually embedded into the PCB and they would use like a glycol system to basically pump fluid into the PCBs itself. Very complex to do. Um, <laughs> so uh, most are just using heat sinks. Um, uh, the challenge is if they can't use fans for cooling and it's in an enclosed environment. So that's why I was explaining. Uh, one of the best ways is to use heavier ground plane layers, uh, maybe okay. milled under the edge of the board. And then that part of the board slots in and becomes part of the heat dissipation. Because now the heat's going to go down through the ground planes out to the edge and actually dissipate through the chassis itself. Or, okay. or you stitch as many thermal vias into the PCB as you possibly can. When you're doing very, very high frequency up in uh, 40, 60 gigahertz, if you ever look at them type of designs, you'll actually see that there's absolutely hundreds of vias and most of them are used for cooling uh, because the, the, the PCBs can get very hot. So they try and get as much copper in there to dissipate as much heat all over the PCB as they can. So what are some good practices to build heavy copper boards? So challenges with heavy copper is um, you, you get what's called um, a, a transfer. So um, if it's more teaching designers how to design with heavy copper. The problem is if they design areas of the board with heavy copper and areas with none, you get what we call low pressure areas. A lot of the resin tries to flow but the heavy copper tends to stack on top of each other and we get these high pressure areas. So it's now difficult to get resin into the low pressure area. So the challenge as a fabricator is trying to get enough pressure in the low pressure areas to basically press and not cause a DLAM issue. So, um, so they should copper balance layers. So uh, when you're talking to customers, trying to educate them, you need as, as much copper balancing on all the layers as you possibly can. And the higher you go on copper, the worse that's actually going to become. Um, so that, that's part of the big challenge. And you're going to get this telegraphing that the image tries to push itself through or onto the surface. So you'll see this um, uneven surface on the surface of the board due to all the low pressure errors and high pressure errors. And that sometimes becomes a challenge. And we're trying to, to do imaging if you were using artwork. But today we're all using LDI. It tends not to be as big an issue as it used to be trying to get off contact with, with artworks. So uh, the big thing I would explain is to designers, they need the copper balance layers, uh, as much copper on the layer to get even pressure on the actual um, journal lamination. The other challenge is obviously going to be etching. It's going to be your capability at lines and space, but typically these heavy copper builds, they're bigger features and you're not going to be doing three mil lines in a four inch copper, put it that way. So, um, so they tend to be um, uh, chunkier type designs, I should say. So okay. now it also depends what you mean by heavy copper. Heavy copper to me is three, four, five ounce. To some people it's anything above two ounces. So, so Okay. So what are the thermal interface materials that you mostly see in aerospace PCBs? Would you recommend using different materials? They use different, uh, it depends where, um, some of them may use something like a cool span. Uh, cool span is a slightly different material because that is actually thermally and electrically conductive. Um, so it's probably one of the highest um, thermally conductive materials, but it is electrically conductive as well because it actually contains silver. Um, so a lot of, uh, funny, I was talking to a customer yesterday, an aerospace customer, and they were asking about that material. And that's the only material I could see if you wanted both thermal and electrical um, connection. For instance, if you're bonded to a heat sink or, or whatever you're trying to bond to. Um, so there's other materials out there. Um, it depends if, it, if you want it to be a thermosetting type bond or it's just a press, you're just pressing it and, and it can be done at a, a low temperature. So it really depends what you need. But cool span is one of the 
the best materials for thermal and electrical if, if you're going to use it. But yeah, there's a list of different materials. I, most of the uh, most of that type of design I've been involved in, they were actually bonded in the press itself. So the the uh, thermal heat sink was actually embedded inside the board or the PC was then bonded to it. Or in some cases, in some RF designs, you can actually buy the material that's pre-bonded to uh, a copper or brass type heat sink. And one of the most challenging materials I used to use uh, was actually a, a material called Invar, which is iron. Uh, but that was more of a constraining material uh, to stop PCBs from expanding and contracting um, during thermal cycling. Because uh, it had a CTE in the X and Y of around uh, four to five ppm, so very, very small. But as you can imagine, trying to put iron cores inside a board, they have to be chemically milled, except that becomes a challenge as well. But I still see designs out there with Envar cores inside them. Uh, what is your advice to designers working on satellite applications where boards will have to properly function in space for say 20 years or more? Um, that's a good question. So there's two, two, two things. You, you need to basically design reliability into the board. So uh, you, you really need to ensure that um, the design itself, you know, when you specify your design rules or your uh, specs for um, the fabrication that, you know, you're using conservative type features. Uh, you wanna ensure that the minimum plating thicknesses, um, you wanna select, um, you know, like the, the most reliable surface finish, et cetera, as well. But probably most important, you need to ensure you're using a board shop that can build <laughs> um, high level type product. So, uh, so you need to select fabricators that are building 80, 90% of class three type product most of the time, or they have, um, they have pedigree at building these types of product because uh, it, it's all down to process control. It's all down to how well the fabricator is actually able to build product without inherent type problems in, in the design itself. So you can only design so much into the board uh, and then it's really down to the fabricator. And you know, and I know not all fabricators are made equal. So, you know, you're not gonna go to a, a small, you know, mom and pop shop to build product that's gonna go into satellite. So, um, so yeah, there's, you know, I look around um, and there seems to be less and less selection of board shops um, that can actually build satellite applications. So uh, I, I could probably name less than 10 now in North America. So, so. but yeah, it's, there is, there, there's a lot you can do in design. I, I tell them be conservative. You know, I wouldn't suggest doing, you know, five stack micro vias using four mil vias. So, uh, so there, there is things that they need to understand about high turn, you know, high level reliability. So it's, yeah, conservative. That's, that's the word conservatism. Okay. Thank you. Do you see a lot of aerospace boards with controlled impedance? Are the requirements different? Yes. Um, uh, it's sort of different now because um, I deal now a lot in the RF world. Um, so RF, you could say it's controlled and beans, but it's it's radio free, it's high frequency. So so you're beyond, you know, 50 ohm, you know, uh, pair matching and, and this type of design. But yeah, aerospace do a lot of controlled and beans designs, not as much as um, the digital world, uh, but, but they're in a different sort of, a different world. But yeah, there is, you know, people at Collins, uh, Lockheed, uh, they're all, they still do a lot of um, higher digital type designs with uh, controlled impedance type requirements. 
So, but, but I get more involved now in the RF side, which is, you know, up into the 20, 30 gigahertz range. So we're beyond standard digital type controlled impedance. So then, then you're up into more exotic material, you know, you're up into the PTFE type materials. So, but yes, the answer is yes. There is quite a lot of controlled impedance boards in aerospace. Okay. They're still doing a lot of data transfer, you know, you know, um, they still do a lot of embedded computing type products as well. So yeah, there is, there is controlled impedance. Okay. Are there any particular DRC settings or DFM requirements that designers need to know for aerospace applications? Not really. So if, if a designer is familiar with designing to class three, then he should be familiar with all the IPC um, rules and regulations. So um, uh, today it, it's very simple uh, for designers now to put their DRC settings into their CAM software and it basically can avoid a lot of these issues. So spacing requirements, um, hole sizes, um, uh, the, the challenge now comes, I, I'm starting to see more back drill and a whole bunch of different requirements now because of controlled impedance in aerospace type applications. Um, like two years ago, I was looking at some and seeing type back drill requirements, you know, I was looking at, you know, uh, four different hole sizes and nearly 10 different depths on both sides of the boards. So this becomes more of a challenge for the fabricator uh, to ensure that there's enough spacing uh, to do this type of work. Uh, but everything else, you know, things like plating, hole sizes, spacing requirements, um, um, and really they should understand the fabricator's uh, capability as well. So they should know, you know, what what is leading edge. They should know what your edge comp type requirements are so you know don't be designing you know lines and spaces in heavier copper if it's beyond the fabricator's capability or, or it's leading edge so there's there's a whole bunch of drc settings that um uh, i used to, so sometimes it would ask me for my drc settings from fabrication and i always refuse to give it to them it's the same as i'm asking you for can you give us a list of your capabilities? I would always refuse to do that because once you tell them you can do, you know, a two and a half mil line in space, or you can do, you know, a, a 20 to one aspect ratio, or you can do this or that, guess what? The next design you get in from that designer has all these features. And then when you run it through your DFM or DRC system, you look at it and you go, well, my yields are only going to be 70%. So one, I'm going to charge them 30% more, but two, I'm more concerned that the boards aren't going to be that reliable because something is going to fail somewhere. So, so yeah, be, be always be careful given designers your all your DRC or your capability type um, knowledge. So uh, typically what I get them to do is I used to get them just to send me, get them to write out their most complex component, typically the BGA or whatever, and then just send it in to one of your field apps and get them just to run a quick DFM just in that part of the design and then feed it back. So, um, or the, get them to talk to the field apps before they start to do the design, just to get a feeling for, you know, how many layers is it going to be? What sort of hole sizes? What sort of pad sizes are they going to use? Just sort of that keeps within the aerospace rules. Uh, because the last thing you want to do is say, well, I can do a, you know, a drill plus 10 and meet class three. Well, guess what? They end up doing three lamination type uh, design. And then you turn around and say, but I can't meet you know, a, a drill plus 10 on the final lamb because everything shifts during each lamination. So you need to explain in detail that each time we do a lamination, we're going to increase our pad sizes by two mils. So, so that final lamb, them internal pads need to be at 14 mils. So, so just so they understand. So, but just be careful telling designers, 
because they design everything when they don't need to. You know, I see designs and they've used drill plus 10 and they could have used drill plus 20, but you told them drill plus 10, so they use drill plus 10. So, but yeah, so, but yeah, there's designers that they need to understand the design rules for aerospace. So. Okay. Uh, have you seen any new trends for electronics used in space? Uh, no, it's still, they're still looking at uh, next generation. The, the, pr the problem now is um, uh, the, amount of, the amount of area in the sky is completely full. So, so if you imagine each satellite sits in its own little cubic area, you know, whatever that is, you know, like 100 or 150 square miles, whatever it needs to be. So uh, talking to some of the satellite guys, they're now looking to build satellites to put another satellite into the same area. So now the control of that satellite is more important because obviously it, it can't get anywhere near the other satellite. So uh, the other thing they're looking at is building more modular type satellites. So what I mean by that is you, you build modules that you can now send up a robot with a replacement module in five or 10 years. It can remove this module and replace it. And now you've upgraded a satellite without having to spend 300 or $400 million. Um, uh, the other thing they're looking at is, is, is payloads. So they want to put bigger payloads into the satellite. So now they're talking about launching it without the solar arms, for instance, so that the satellite can be bigger and then launch the solar arms separately and then attach them later on. So um, the, there's probably gonna be more robotics in space where robots will go up to do repairs, to do module changes. So, but we're talking 15, 20 years out. So this is, this is the thinking is, how didn't get more life out of satellites, you know, and repair them as well, so. And obviously they try to make them small. So the big, the big uh, push is now for these constellation type networks. Um, so as of end of last year, there was only 40% of the constellations that were supposed to go up there. And some of these constellations can, can consist of anywhere from 4,000 uh, to 20,000 satellites in one constellation to cover the whole globe so so that that's a really big market and the other thing with these satellites is they're only short life satellites they'll only they'll only stay up there for three to five years and then they'll obviously need to be replaced so uh, so that's that's the big trend now is these constellation type satellites basically they're small they can launch you know 40 or 50 of them or, or more 100 in one satellite launch, you know, so that that's the big trend is constellation small satellites. Okay, that sounds interesting. Uh, it's going to be big business. Yeah. I spoke to one of them, and I asked about the volumes, and they said they need forty thousand. So that's per forty thousand satellites, and then there was about eight to ten PCBs per satellite. So, so you can imagine that, and then replacing that every five or 10 years. So it's, it's just a massive amount of business.